Welcome back to the Foreign Desk Podcast. I'm Lisa Daftari. We've had a very busy week here, and I want to thank all of those who tuned in for my interview with the Crown Princess of Iran uh, with the LA World Affairs Council. Uh, for those who missed it, you can check our social media pages where it will be linked to the uh, YouTube um, page where you can find the interview in its entirety there. Uh, and continuing with the fast pace at which the Biden administration uh, has been marching forward to get an Iran deal, uh, we want to talk about that. We know that the Biden administration is very interested in getting some sort of deal with Iran's regime. We know that the Islamic Republic is very interested in getting back into a deal. They've said it many times, even before uh, President Biden was elected. They're hoping that they can have a redo of some sort. So it's only a matter of time before this game of chicken comes to an end with some sort of resolution between the two. Now, in the meantime, we're not hearing from the biggest uh, component in this arena, and that's the 82 million Iranian people. What do they want? Are they justly being represented on the world stage? And to break this all down for us, we will call upon my good friend, Cameron uh, he is the policy uh, director at NAFTI, the National Union for Democracy in Iran, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, organization of Iranian Americans based in DC. They do fantastic, fantastic work. They're raising awareness about the freedom movement in Iran, about the people of Iran, and um, serving as a conduit between the people of Iran and policymaking in Washington. Cameron completed his undergraduate uh, education at Harvard, of course, and uh, he formerly worked at BlackRock. Welcome to the program, Cameron. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so, you know, you've obviously been very, very influential in this space, and I want to get to a lot of the work that you do and your emphasis on really um, correcting the narrative in Washington, D.C., to get at all the, the nuance, meaning um, what cultural, societal, political details are missing from the narrative about what the Iranian people want, what they're experiencing, what they would like for their future. Uh, and in doing so, uh, this week, you've been quite busy getting the word out about a new campaign that began in Iran by the opposition to the regime. Uh, and we say that broadly, the opposition to the regime comes in obviously many forms. And um, these are people who, who want regime change. They want this regime to be out. And they're doing this uh, ahead of the June 18 elections in Iran. Uh, and they've gotten the word out. They've made it viral, so to speak. We've seen it all throughout social media this week. And uh, let's take a look at their very, very, uh, very poignant, very, very powerful logo. It says no to the Islamic Republic in Farsi, Nabij of Islami. And it has a black thumbs down, obviously referring to um, the uh, election and not wanting uh, this election and calling for a removal of the regime in its entirety. Uh, Cameron, so tell us a little bit about how this uh, campaign started when you first heard about it and why you've decided to support it. Uh, Lisa, again, thank you for having me on, on the program. It's a pleasure to be with you, and, and thank you for all that you do uh, in spreading the word about what's happening in Iran and the Iranian people's struggle for secular democracy. Uh, in your introduction, I think you hit the nail on the head. The most important thing um, that those abroad should know about this camp campaign is what an authentic movement it is. It, it's come from inside Iran. You've seen the logo uh, that you just displayed uh, shared in Tehran's bazaar. Uh, in uh, the uh, Azadi Square, or formerly known as Shahyad Square, the perhaps most famous monument uh, in Tehran. You've seen uh, members of the Islamic Republic's armed forces, the Atesh or the IRGC, uh, masking their faces and holding up the logo uh, as supporters of the campaign. You've seen uh, children, you've seen parents whose uh, children have been murdered by the Islamic Republic. So this is a campaign that started uh, inside Iran by the Iranian people, um, and it has a very simple message, which is what you said, no to the Islamic Republic. Uh, it's something uh, that I think has served as a point of unity uh, for many uh, different forces uh, of the opposition, many different individuals from all walks of life who are opposed to this regime. So although it started inside the country uh, and it really found its base there, it's quickly spreading and, and it really has served as a point of unity for people of a variety of political backgrounds to come and support the campaign. Uh, you have people all across the political spectrum doing so, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, but because it started inside Iran, and it's such an authentic point of protest against this criminal regime, uh, that's why I personally decided to support it. 
Uh, and I want to read a bit about their, their the statements um, coming out about the movement. Fellow Iranian, the cry of no to the Islamic Republic has resonated in every corner of Iran. This is the call of a people determined to remove the Islamic Republic, this primary obstacle to freedom, prosperity, democracy, progress, and human rights. The emergence of the no to the Islamic Republic campaign in conjunction with other political and civil movements promises greater coherence and convergence of the Iranian people's struggle for freedom and justice and for liberation from the Islamic Republic. Patriotic Iranians whose hearts and minds are overflowing with the hope of freedom and prosperity for Iran together. Let's make no to the Islamic Republic the focal point of national solidarity to form a large and inclusive movement to forever rid Iran of the poverty and misery of this dark regime, the Islamic Republic. You know, you say it's a point of, of unity for many groups that are opposed uh, to the regime. For the average person to wrap their minds around it, it's almost black and white. Obviously, the regime represents evil. The people who don't want the regime would all be on board together, unified. Why isn't there unity among the opposition to the regime? It's a very good question, Lisa, and it's one that often is discussed, uh, as you well know. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that when people are up against a totalitarian, brutal dictatorship that has had uh, really uh, no concern uh, to kill people that disagree with it with vengeance and with extreme violence uh, and without any remorse whatsoever, that it's difficult to unite the opponents of that group. Uh, the regime has been in power for 42 years. Inside the country, it has systematically jailed, tortured, uh, raped and killed its opponents. Uh, it has gone on sprees of international assassination campaigns. Some of the leading figures uh, of the opposition abroad throughout the 80s, 90s, and even more recently today, we're seeing an uptick of this, have been assassinated. Former prime ministers, former generals, uh, leading artists have all been killed by the Islamic Republic. Uh, and in addition to its violent campaign, it runs a very effective and well-financed campaign to sow discord between uh, the opposition, between those who are opposed to the Islamic Republic. It very frequently creates uh, fake opposition. Uh, and this is a tactic that totalitarian states around the world use. In fact, the New York Times uh, had a great piece about how uh, Vladimir Putin and, and the Russian regime do this themselves against their own opposition. When it's about Russia, it gets a lot of um, credit and written widely about in the Western press. But when it comes to the Islamic Republic, it's often ignored. So when you're up against a totalitarian regime that has billions of dollars that it has stolen from the Iranian people, and then it uses uh, to sow discord, to send people abroad, um, to defame uh, and libel and slander the opposition and, and those who want a secular democracy, um, that's how they've been able to do that up until now. Uh, but I, I really do think that there are signs for hope. Um, after this campaign started inside the country, you quoted extensively from uh, the open statement in support of it, hundreds of people, hundreds of extremely well-known people across uh, the Iranian community inside the country and in exile uh, from all political walks of life, artists, poets, university professors, uh, political people have all come out to support this. So more and more, we are seeing growing, uh, a growing unity uh, and collaboration and, and cohesion amongst the secular democratic forces opposed to this regime. Uh, and I think that's why the regime is so scared. Yeah, and scared because, uh, you know, what's worse than 82 disenchanted people who are now extremely courageous to have their voices heard? You know, for 42 years, it wasn't always that way. The crackdowns are brutal and the punishments are very severe. People don't want their faces shown. If you go out to a protest, you can get shot. We all obviously saw the iconic face of Neda, who became, you know, the, the face of, of the 2009 Green Revolution as she was just shot you know, point blank on the street, uh, a very talented young lady. Um, let's look at some of these very courageous Iranians who are, are posting videos of themselves supporting this No to the Islamic Republic campaign. <laughs> من به عنوان یک نظامی اتحاد انبستگی خود را با کمپین نه به جمهوری اسلامی اعلام می کنم. پاینده ایران خلابان به تمامی بدین مردان و شیرزنانی که برای آزادی کشور عزیزمون ایران تلاش می کنند. 
من هم مانند بانوان دیگر به کمپین نه به جمهوری اسلامی می پیوندم. اینجا میدون شهریار نه به جمهوری اسلامی مک بر دیکتاتور نه به جمهوری اسلامی من همه اعلام می کنم که جمهوری اسلامی انتخاب من نیست نه به جمهوری اسلامی آینده ایران و ایرانی جمهوری اسلامی نه 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 نمیخوام اسفند 99 اینجا میدون شهریار نه به جمهوری اسلامی مرگ بر دیکتاتور نه به جمهوری اسلامی نه به جمهوری اسلامی نه به جمهوری اسلامی نه به جمهوری اسلامی uh, quite a long montage there and you ha you'd have to understand there were so many more that I would love to show. My producer and I had a very hard time editing those down to just show. Um, and for those who are listening to the audio version of this podcast who don't understand Farsi, I want to do a really quick recap. We had children, women, um, older, younger, uh, military personnel, um, all disguising themselves in some capacity and hide, showing a sign of no to the Islamic Republic, which is the tagline of the campaign. Um, a lot of them had a follow-up line, I support this movement and I do not support the Islamic Republic. A lot of them said death to the dictator, referring to Khamenei, referring to the supreme leader of the um, Islamic Republic. Um, you know, we saw the thumbs down uh, by one of the women who was outside uh you know it's it's far and wide and of course the two videos showing um you know uh people wearing gloves and of course disguising themselves to a certain extent and putting the uh, a piece of paper with the hashtag on windshield wipers underneath doors in front of buildings and the other guy who was putting the stickers on uh, tel on, on uh, intercoms on in tel telephone booths on people's cars just stickers with the with the hashtag no to the islamic republic this is a lot of courage. Um, obviously, these, these people could be charged with treason, being punishable by death by spreading this kind of message. Um, you know, where, how did we get here? I mean, 42 years and you've seen people really risk their lives to get this message out. You're right. Uh, and it's, it's so important for those watching and listening to recognize exactly what you just said, Lisa, which is uh, the gravity of this situation, what these individuals inside Iran are risking to do this. And it is their lives. Uh, it is their livelihoods. Um, when we talk about uh, protests, you mentioned Neda Agha Sultan, uh, who was a young woman who was shot by a sniper uh, in the 2009 protest. Uh, Puya Bakhtiari was uh, a protester who was killed in one of the last rounds of major anti-regime uh, protests. Um, his father came out this morning uh, and supported this campaign. And he wrote on his Instagram page, uh, that my son Puya signed this declaration, signed the note to the Islamic Republic declaration with his blood. So the Iranian people have, have reached a point where after 42 years, after 42 years of being uh, brutalized, being jailed en masse, being killed, women being statutorily, legally worth half of men, uh, religious minorities being unable to uh, attend school and university, uh, all sorts of absolute repression, oppression, and suppression, they've reached the point where everyone is uh, on the same page about putting 
their hands together and ending the Islamic Republic. Uh, you know, Javad Zarif, who is the chief propagandist for the Islamic Republic, who's often feted uh, by international institutions, by the international media, um, he was often referred to as a reformist or a moderate, um, said that the people of Iran chose to live like this. They chose the Islamic Republic. What the people of Iran are now doing is refuting that without question. They did not choose to live like this. They do not choose the Islamic Republic, and they will no longer tolerate it ruling over them uh, with no legitimacy or no authority. You know, when you say the people didn't choose Islamic Republic, how can we quantify that? Well, I mean, have you ever quantified that? Is there a percentage uh, or that we can use? Um, what, what percentage of the Iranian people are against the regime? Um, how do we know that? And um, how, do we, how do we correct the narrative here? It's, it's a very good question. You know, oftentimes uh, polls are done abroad uh, by uh, those who are affiliated with the Islamic Republic uh, and used uh, to support the notion that uh, the people of Iran support this regime, that the people of Iran want nuclear weapons, uh, that the people of, uh, of Iran are, are turning against America. Uh, that is all, uh, to be honest, uh, lies and propaganda uh, supported by the regime itself. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to do polling inside Iran. It's very difficult to um, systematically quantify how the people of Iran look at things. But there are two ways of doing so. One, there are some scholars who are able to do this. One of them is in Europe uh, named uh, Amor Maliki. Uh, and he has year after year done uh, really systematic studies of uh, Iranian public opinion. And he shows uh, that a overwhelming majority uh, of the people of Iran are opposed to the Islamic Republic. We're talking uh, on the number of 70, 80, 90 percent of Iranians being against this regime. Uh, they increasingly look uh, to the opposition to the Islamic Republic as the alternative. Uh, they increasingly look uh, to people like Reza Pahlavi, uh, who is the son uh, uh, of the Shah and, and one of the leaders of the secular democratic opposition. They increasingly look to these groups um, to provide an alternative. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that you continue to see abroad, uh, many say that uh, uh, through the elections of the Islamic Republic, perhaps we'll see moderates or perhaps we'll see reformists. Uh, there are no reformists or moderates that survive in a system like this for this long. Perhaps there were those uh, who actually held hope for moderation, actually held hope for reform. Um, but if that were the case, and if they were acting on any goodwill, they would have left the system by now. Uh, the people that we talk about, or that rather the Western media and, and analysts talk about as being reformists or moderates, for example, the current president, Hassan Rouhani, uh, are on the record saying that uh, those who are against the regime should be hung up during Friday prayers and hung so people can see. Uh, he, he, he himself bragged about dragging women, uh, whining uh, and nagging about not wanting to wear the hijab, but he forced them to wear the hijab, the mandatory Islamic headscarf. Um, so it's difficult to analyze, but you can also see how Iranians think in their protests. When they say uh, reformist hardliner, the game is up, they're responding to the international media and analysts who are pushing uh, the lie of, of reform in Iran. When they say our enemy is right here, they lie when they say it's America, they're pushing back on the regime's narrative of death to America. They're pushing back on the propaganda that's spread about them. The people of Iran overwhelmingly want a secular democracy. They want freedom. They want the same rights that we enjoy living here in the United States. And they expect the world to stand with them in that challenge. Just as the people of the world stood with the people of Eastern Europe in their struggle for freedom, the people of South Africa and theirs. And now it's really time for the people of the world to stand with the Iranians. Yeah, and you know what's crazy, and, and you probably have a, a front row seat um, uh, on this issue, is you know we're in the year 2021. Books and cartoons are being canceled because they're not appropriate or they're not, you know, they're not politically correct. We're, we're living in such a um, a social justice frenzy. I mean, you don't know where to look because it's just it's just a, a lot to absorb and. Then you, you ask yourself, where are these rights groups when it comes to the women of Iran? Where are they when it comes to the athletes that are being brutally murdered for speaking out? Where are they uh, when the journalists are being grounded up? Where are they when someone gets thrown into prison for an Instagram post? I mean, where are, I mean, why, why is everyone on the wrong side of, of this in, in terms of, of, of history? It, it's a very good question, and it, it's something that frustrates those of us who work in this space. But more than that, it's something that insults Iranians. I mean, when you talk to people inside the country, they, they simply couldn't believe uh, that secular Democrats, that progressives abroad wouldn't stand with them. Um, at NUFTI, we're a, a nonpartisan organization, and it's our, our mission, really, to work with people of any political uh, persuasion abroad to convince them to stand in solidarity with the movement for uh, secular democracy and human rights 
in Iran. Uh, but we do see a huge chasm between those who in other matters uh, are progressive, um, but who end up ignoring the cause of the Iranian people. I, I don't think that's because they're bad people by any means. I think that it's because the Islamic Republic has a very effective uh, propaganda mechanism abroad. It has um, individuals uh, abroad uh, in, in, in media outlets, uh, in think tanks, uh, in different groups who push their agenda. Uh, and they often disguise that agenda very cleverly. They disguise it in uh, 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 you know, being anti-war. Everyone is anti-war, nobody wants war. But right now the Islamic Republic is waging a war on the people of Iran. The Islamic Republic is waging a war on the people of Syria. Uh, and the propaganda that's uh, pushed by the regime and, and its affiliates and allies uh, and apologists abroad naturally ignores that. So I think the answer to your question, uh, Lisa, as to why that's the case uh, is because uh, the regime has been very effective at pushing its propaganda. Um, but again, I, I'm hopeful. More and more, we see that Iranians are speaking up. We see that Iranian Americans are speaking up and coming together and saying that uh, those who are pushing the lies and the agenda of the Islamic Republic do not represent us. They do not represent what we believe um, because the vast majority of Iranians uh, do want support. Um, we're not talking about foreign-based uh, intervention or foreign-based regime change. We're, we're simply talking about solidarity. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, Natan Sharansky, uh, the famous, of course, Soviet dissident, uh, said that when President Reagan uh, called the Soviet Union an evil empire, um, he and his, and his fellow prisoners in the gulags were jumping for joy. Uh, they tapped out the message uh, in Morse code on the wall to pass it between prisoners. Uh, they said it was the end of the Soviet Union and it was the beginning for them. It was the most glorious of days, he says. Um, that's what the people of Iran need. They need the moral leadership and solidarity from the people of the West when they're fighting uh, a gender apartheid, murderous regime. Uh, that's what they need. You know, um, I, I want to break down because the average average viewer um, is asking themselves, propaganda machine, I mean, infiltrating Washington, this sounds crazy. And then, you know, um, in the mainstream media, we had a leak uh, a few months ago about Chinese infiltration and everybody was shocked. China sending interns to political offices here in Washington, D.C., or China, you know, sending, um, you know, people to our, our best universities, uh, China doing this, doing that. Well, my reaction, I'm sure yours is the same. Well, the Iranian regime has been doing this for years. So no shock there. Um, you know, to, again, to the average person, let's break this down. How do they infiltrate? Why do they infiltrate? And how is it that, um, you know, how is it that Zarif gets an interview on CNN where he's able to throw, you know, stones at, at, at American leadership? Or how is it that, you know, you have um, NGOs all over Washington, other individuals that are well-placed in all facets, whether it's comedy, Hollywood, um, journalism, et cetera. How, do they, how, well, how does this machine work? Well, first of all, I think to those who are shocked by this, uh, don't be shocked. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, let, let's remember just a bit about who and what this regime is. Uh, this is a regime that uh, just as soon as it took power, executed Iran's first female minister who served under the Shah because she was a woman. Uh, it executed the leader of Iran's Jewish community because he was Jewish. So uh, to be surprised or shocked that the Islamic Republic has propagandists abroad uh, really shouldn't be all that shocking. Uh, nothing is shocking when it comes to this regime. Um, but its propaganda is particularly effective, again, because it does wrap it um, in things which sound quite nice. Um, uh, for example, being, no, uh, being against war. Well, everyone's against war, uh, but they're able to really use that um, as an effective tool um, uh, there, there are individuals across Washington, D.C. who, as you, as you have rightly said, um, infiltrated the media, infiltrated think tanks, uh, and they've just consistently pushed this narrative. Um, and I think that they've taken advantage of people's goodwill. They've taken advantage of, of many Americans and many uh, Westerners in general. Um, you know, again, general goodwill. Um, and they've been extremely effective in doing so. Just a few things that people should watch out for. Uh, when they're listening to somebody talk about Iran, the first thing you should ask any Iran analyst or expert or somebody introduces him or herself in that capacity, just to know whether they're serious or not, should be very simple. And it relates to this campaign. Should the Islamic Republic go yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then you can have a conversation with that person. Maybe you won't agree on everything. In fact, you probably won't agree on everything. But if the answer is waffling, if the answer is, well, maybe, or I'm not sure, 
uh, or well, what's the alternative? It will become like Syria. All those are our excuses. When we were looking at uh, the Nazi regime, when we were looking at the regime of Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, uh, any, any brutal dictatorship, nobody of good faith comes to you and says, well, I'm not sure if it should go. It would really just be quite messy and gosh, something worse could, could, could come after. The people of Iran are being slaughtered in the streets. They're standing up bravely. They're sending a message. They, they send messages in English very often saying, stand with us. During the 2009 protest, they said, uh, Obama, Obama, Yabama, Yabona, which is in Persian means Mr. Obama, Mr. Obama. Are you with us? Or are you with them? They're, they're sending messages, as, as it's often said, they're not practicing their linguistics when they do that. They're sending a message. Um, however, you mentioned the, the influence of these individuals and the pro-regime uh, uh, affiliates and lobbyists abroad. Again, I'm very hopeful. This letter that you mentioned uh, is signed by hundreds of individuals, not only uh, politicians or people of political persuasions, but some of Iran's leading artists. Uh, you, you know, you have people like Daryush and Babake Amini and Sandy, and you know, obviously for a Western audience that uh, that may not be uh, look mean up a whole Sandy, lot. Guys, yeah, I really, look, 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 I, up, look I up all these people. You know, th this you know we have uh, we have we have Tom Jones and I don't know Justin Timberlake, you know, of Iran signing uh, this declaration saying that no, this regime should go. Um, and it's a very clear message and it's becoming uh, more and more uh, widely accepted. And again, a point of unity for all of us uh, who want to free Iran. Absolutely. I love those analogies of Tom Jones and Justin Timberlake. And, um, for, for those who are not Persian, go look up some of Sandy's music. It's, it's really catchy, really, really entertaining stuff. Um, you know, perhaps the popularity behind this campaign is in, in its simplicity, right? Um, you know, no to the Islamic Republic. That's just no to the Islamic Republic. We want something better. And obviously it's alluding to regime change or, um, you know, what is the hope, um, you know, on the sh short term and on the long term of this campaign? Hmm. Well, I, th I think that, again, this is, a, this is a very broad campaign. Hundreds of people, and I imagine that in the coming days, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people uh, will be uh, wanting to support it. Um, the whole focus uh, of this campaign, in fact, one of the impetuses behind this campaign, uh, those uh, of us supporting it, is that it does not belong to any one particular individual or group. So uh, I can't say uh, for certain what uh, the campaign will do or, or what it will hope to do. I think that's, in fact, the point is that um, based on collective wisdom, based on collaboration and cooperation, um, serious secular Democrats, those uh, who want a better future of Iran, uh, can have as this campaign uh, a forum to come together uh, for it to be uh, a source of, of collective cooperation and then collective action. Um, I think that uh, this presents many opportunities, as you mentioned. Um, coming up in June, uh, the Islamic Republic will put on its, uh, its, uh, its kabuki theater once again uh, of the elections uh, that it holds. Um, and I think that probably one of, of the very first things I would imagine that this campaign will do uh, is work to support uh, uh, an active campaign to boycott these elections. Again, uh, going back to the Western media, you'll see uh, probably a lot of coverage of this. Um, but what's important to remember about uh, these coming elections is that they are fake. They have no legitimacy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, not only at the end of the day uh, are the results rigged to whatever the system, whatever the Supreme Leader wants, even before you get to that phase, um, the Islamic Republic itself and its various councils and committees, uh, all of which uh, are effectively uh, uh, managed by clerics, uh, most of whom are over the age of 70, 80 or 90 years old, disqualify uh, any candidates who do not bear total allegiance to the Islamic Republic and its supreme leader, who are not Shiite males. Um, so uh, the election facade, uh, again, Kabuki theater that you'll see in the coming months, uh, I imagine will be uh, one of the points uh, that this campaign uh, will look to focus on. Um, but again, it's it's a national campaign, and that's what's so unique about it. That's why I think why I think it has been supported so broadly because it doesn't belong to anyone in particular. It belongs to the Iranian people. Yeah, and, and that's really the beauty of it. This is such a, a grassroots movement, so very similar to what we saw in 2009, coming straight from the mouths of the Iranian people themselves, um, who protest and have have really risked their lives at every turn to express, like you said, to really tell us um, what what they want, what they need. You know, but what we saw in the last election, um, Cameron, and I'm sure um, you you have witnessed the same, is as we get closer. Um, some of the Iranian people, they, they, they basically say, well, we're going to support the reformist candidate because 
this is what this is what we have. We have to choose between bad and worse. And you and I both know it's really worse and worse. It's really not. There's no differentiation. It's actually wor sometimes worse to have a reformist quote unquote candidate because it's a wolf in sheep's clothing to the West. And therefore, the the real narrative, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't come out even as as easily as if you have someone who really um, says it like like they mean it uh and for that reason i mean but I, I i interviewed a lot of iranians in the last election that said you know we're gonna we're gonna support rohani and i said I, how about you know the stolen election of 2009 how about you know and they do believe everything you just said that these are rigged elections that it's within a system that only supports itself and candidates that only echo uh the islamic republic's uh way of of governing uh, and you know nothing has changed. Their money is going into Syria and into Yemen and into the pockets of terrorists. And they are taking you know young people to the guillotine. And they know that nothing's changed, but yet they think that they have to at least participate to not have the worst candidate. Uh, I, I think that for a long time, uh, in fact, probably about twenty years, uh, what we would refer to as the reform movement in Iran, sort of people like Hassan Rouhani, the current president, or uh, before him, Mohammad Khatami. Uh, were viewed as people who could potentially make a bit of a change. They could possibly bring out some positive developments from within uh, this clerical system. Um, and you can't blame, uh, of course, Iranians uh, for, for hoping for that and for trying for that. Uh, there were those from the very first day who rightly said um, that this regime cannot be reformed. You cannot expect behavior change because when you have a system uh, that is really cancerous to the bone, you you simply can't change that. You have to get rid of it. You have to establish secular democracy. And again, you know, leading secular Democrats uh, like Reza Pahlavi have said that from the first day. However, when you're living inside Iran, of course, there were people who who had hope in the reform movement, and many, may, maybe even millions of people who had hope in the reform movement. But even with the last election of, uh, or the quote unquote election of Hassan Rouhani, everything has changed in Iran. Everything has changed. Uh, I mean, Hassan Rouhani uh, made the typical promises that reformists make during their elections, and none of them came true. You know, the people of Iran, uh, for one example, the women of Iran are not going to accept as reform the fact that they can move their headscarf a bit further back, or that maybe they can wear a bit more colored lipstick, or they can wear a different colored nail polish. This is hugely insulting to the women of Iran. And year after year, election after election, Reformists have come and told them that things would get better and told them that their lives would improve and it never ever happened. In fact, as you say, uh, it, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing and perhaps made things worse because what it did was it bought credibility uh, and legitimacy for this regime, especially in the eyes of the international community, especially in the eyes of the international media who were looking for some source uh, of moderation from within the country. So after Rouhani's last election, what you've seen uh, are consecutive two to three massive uprisings, nationwide uprisings against the Islamic Republic. Uh, the Dema uprising in, in the December of 2017, January 2018, uh, the Aubon Mah protests in November of 2019, in which the Reuters number says 1,500 people were killed. But now other estimates that we're seeing slowly come out, some say 3,000, some say up to 9,000 people. Mm -hmm. So when you have a regime the, who, whose response to popular protest, popular demonstration, is to mount heavy machine guns and slaughter people, you can't expect people to go back to the polls in such a system. Now, of course, there will be some people who vote uh, still when you have 82, 84 million people in a country. There are some who do support the regime. Uh, but it's my estimation that the vast and overwhelming majority uh, will not do so, do not support the regime. In fact, in the last election, which was the parliamentary election, uh, in March of, of 2020, we saw extremely low voter turnout. Uh, the regime was able to sort of cover it up because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, right. But I think that even fewer people will participate this time. You know, speaking of, of legitimacy, um, now between now and June, there's a very, very high chance that the U.S. and, and Iran and the, the remaining signatory, uh, who, those who are signatory to the J former JCPOA in 2015 will come to a, an agreement of some sort, whether it's similar to 2015, whether it has some, some, some different, um, you know, some changes in the details. Uh, we know that both sides want it. Now it's a matter of who's going to blink first. Obviously, we're watching as they're courting one another in different ways, um, demanding different changes on both sides. 
Um, what would this do to the freedom movement in Iran if a deal is struck? Well, if a deal is struck and uh, the Islamic Republic is, is once again flush with cash, it would have significant consequences. Uh, the Islamic Republic's repression machine uh, would be once again enabled and empowered to uh, shoot Iranians in the streets, uh, to buy further technology uh, from the Chinese Communist Party and other totalitarian states to more effectively monitor the people of Iran. Uh, it would also have significant consequences outside Iran's borders. Uh, this week and the coming weeks uh, are the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution and, and the Syrian people standing up to Bashar Assad and his dictatorship and calling for freedom. Uh, and it's extremely likely that if the Islamic Republic uh, were not in power, if the Islamic Republic were not supporting Bashar Assad as they have been, to the tune of $700 million per month, according to many estimates, uh, he would no longer be in power. He would no longer be slaughtering the Syrian people, slaughtering Syrian children, uh, showering them with chemical weapons. Uh, so the consequences of an enriched, enabled, and empowered Islamic Republic are detrimental to the people of Iran, but they're also detrimental to people outside of Iran's borders, to the security and stability of the Middle East, and also to uh, peace uh, and stability for the United States and to American national security interests. So the consequences uh, of appeasing this regime uh, are extremely broad uh, and they're perhaps incalculable. Um, at no point will the United States be able to enter into a long-term sustainable agreement uh, with the Islamic Republic. It simply doesn't mesh with the regime's DNA. Um, you know, the, the things that we often, uh, we often have covered as responses from the Islamic Republic, for example, the bombing of Ain al-Assad air base in Iraq, uh, or the uh, or hitting, for example, Saudi oil facilities or Israeli ships or killing American soldiers. Those are often described as responses to X action taken by the United States or, or coalition mm -hmm. forces. In fact, that's simply the Islamic Republic's policy. The Islamic Republic's policy, sudur and galab, to spread the revolution. That's their goal. That's why they uh, support Hamas. That's why they support Hezbollah. It's not a reaction to foreign policy. It is their foreign policy. I mean, what are some of the steps that you take? I mean, everything you're mentioning, it just seems like a no-brainer, right? It's like if you're if you, if you like for, you know human rights, okay, we've got you on that. If you're into you know supporting terror, they've done that too. If you're you know, if, regardless of you know anywhere you turn, you see one of the uh, transgressions of this regime in affecting you know, human lives, whether it's in Iran, if that money, for example, that you said they're pouring into terrorism would be spent on the main street economy in Iran, maybe people wouldn't have to, you know, become, in, you know, involuntary uh, vegetarians. We wrote a piece on that at the foreign desk where people can't even afford to have meat, have give their children protein. Um, these are the, and, and the, the regime always passes this off as, well, it's because of the U U.S. sanctions. That's why we're in the state that we're in. They don't talk about the money that they spent on, on their terror sprees. Um, you know, what are some of the things that, that you do at Nafti to, um, you know, correct this narrative that I know you, you've, I don't think you've ever been to Iran, correct? No, unfortunately like myself. not. Yes, like myself. So we are Iranian Americans who were born in the United States. We've inherited this, you know, um, history from our parents, of course. Um, and I know how hard you work at correcting the narrative, at really being this very professional and extremely knowledgeable source for, you know, the Western world right in Washington, D.C. to understand better what they're missing uh, on, on all of these different facets. Um, what are the, some some of the, the particulars? What are the specific things that, that Nafti is doing and how can other people learn and get involved? Well, first of all, you're very kind and I certainly try to be all of those things. Whether or not I'm successful, I'm not so sure. You are. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, the, the first thing uh, that we do is, is simply try to correct the record and simply provide an alternative viewpoint, uh, which we happen to believe uh, and in fact know is the truth. Uh, we've, we've talked so, so much uh, about the regime's propaganda abroad and, and the real stranglehold that it has been able to put together, unfortunately, uh, on many analysts and, and media personalities who cover Iran. Um, so the first and foremost thing that we try to do is simply provide uh, the other uh, side of the story uh, and, and the truth. You know, we do this through bringing leading Iranian dissidents directly to the American public. Uh, you know, I mentioned Manoucher Bakhtiari earlier, whose son Puya. Uh, became a symbol for the Iranian protest movement after he was murdered. Uh, we had a forum with him uh, where he shared a message directly to President Biden, directly to uh, elected officials, directly to members of the media. Uh, we have had the, the great pleasure of doing the same thing with many other leading activists uh, and dissidents from inside Iran. 
uh, because our goal is to simply is to simply share the message of what Iranians want, and it's really not a lot. They really just want solidarity. They really just want their voices to be heard. So uh, for those uh, wondering how they can help, uh, they can uh, they can uh, certainly follow us on Twitter, uh, Nuftiran or N U F D I R A N, uh, or go to our website, nuftiran.org. Um, there's lots uh, that we can do uh, together in simply sharing the message about what it is that the people of Iran uh, want. And it really is solidarity uh, to the extent that we can grow our organization and grow our movement, uh, especially here in Washington, and, and provide the truth to the media, to elected officials, um, and to those who shape public opinion, for example, at the many think tanks here in Washington. Um, that's our goal. Uh, and we certainly uh, appreciate any support uh, and collaboration from those who are interested. I think that there's a real opportunity um, because, as I said, I don't think that all of the people or even a majority of the people uh, who have bought into the Islamic Republic's propaganda and lies are bad. I, I think that they've been sold a bill of goods. Um, and if they really want to support a progressive cause, if they really want to support a humanitarian cause, there's none better than that of the people of Iran. There's none with a greater chance of succeeding uh, and really establishing uh, a vibrant uh, secular democracy in the Middle East, where from a national security perspective as Americans, we, we, we couldn't need it anymore. Uh, it could really, uh, in addition to the humanitarian impact across the region for the 80 plus million Iranians, it has significant security implications for the United States. Uh, and all of us are against war. And the one way to ensure uh, that the Middle East and that region uh, is no longer uh, ridden by wars is to have a secular and stable democratic Iran. You know, we've seen so much progress with the Abraham Accords. Um, many people are now talking about the Cyrus Accords, which would be the people, uh, the children of Abraham, uh, Jews and Arabs coming together with the children of Cyrus, Iranians. Um, and, and what more fruitful vision for the Middle East could we possibly have than that? And that's one that we're dedicated to. Uh, and that's one that I'll personally, uh, you know, spend day and night working towards. Yes, absolutely. Amen to that. I think it's it's all wonderful. And I encourage people to go watch our, our podcast with um, Victoria Coates and Len Kudrakovsky, who are the authors of absolutely. this report. We actually broke that news here um, on the Foreign Desk together with Bijan Kian, who is a, um, a former cabinet member and, of course, a wonderful Iran analyst. Uh, and Cameron, I thank you so much. I thank you for really dedicating your time to a wonderful cause and to being, you know, this this representative um, on so many levels. And uh, I thank you for for really shifting the narrative, making people think twice before buying into what is told, sold to us by the mainstream media, particularly regarding Iran and its future. And look, the people of the Middle East, as you said, they're on board. Look at the Abraham Accords. We have we have the Arab nations that were so hostile towards Israel, understanding that they have to curb the Islamic Republic. I mean, if we can only get the mainstream media to, to follow the Arabs of the Middle East, then we'd be in a better place, but hopefully soon. And I think that momentum is, is going to take us um, there, hopefully. And I thank you for your time. And to all of you who would like to follow Cameron on social media, it's Hansari Nia uh, on Twitter and Nofti Iran. Um, I will post those as well on my social media. And for the rest of you who would like to sign up for our weekly podcast, you can go to youtube.com slash Lisa Daftari. And to sign up for our daily top 10 email, go to foreigndesknews.com and you can sign up there. Thank you so much. And we will see you next week.